What's going on, everybody? Welcome back into another episode here on the Triple Play Fantasy YouTube channel and the Triple Play Fantasy podcast here. we got a special guest today, and I don't want to hold this back any longer because I'm really excited for the man that's joining me today. We welcome in a man that, as his book says, likes to tackle life head on. This former NFL player played in 67 games, registering 28 receptions for 304 yards and a touchdown, while also setting the world ablaze in the return game. A man who makes me ashamed to take my shirt off and shouldn't be too being on the Triple Play podcast as he's been used to being in front of the camera, whether it was on the gridiron, but also on TV as he was also on Bravo's uh, winning the hearts of ladies across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, time to augment your reality with the guests we have today. Here's Jeff Ogden. How's it going, man? Hey, good. You've done your research. I wasn't expecting all that, but uh, happy to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. You have a, a very just a lot of different endeavors you do. A lot, you're a very interesting guy to, to research and to be able to kind of see all the different things you were doing. But I would be remiss if I didn't start off talking about your book that you uh, that you have out there right now, which is Tackle Life Head On. And I'm curious, uh, can you give us a little bit of just kind of the premise of, of what we find out as a reader getting to read this book that you uh, that you put out there? Yes, uh, thank you. It's uh a book that actually didn't start out as a book. Um, I decided to put some things down on paper as I'm dealing with uh, some issues, um, some concussions that I suffered along the way uh, with my career and uh, decided to put some stories, some things down on paper uh, for my daughter. Uh, she's 21 now and I just wanted to, uh, for her to experience some of the things, to read some of the things, to hear about some of the things I experienced uh, dealing with her and dealing with football and our life in general. And uh, and at some point I decided that there's more than uh, just that. There's more I could do with my platform, with my story. And I think it's a pretty unique one and kind of evolved into this book. And I think Tackle Life Head On. People are like, oh, you're a wide receiver. Why is it called Tackle Life Head On? And um, I think for me, it was a way that I could express the obstacles to demonstrate how I was able to overcome some of these obstacles and now dealing with the obstacle that I'm not going to be able to overcome. Uh, it's a degenerative brain disease that, you know, I can't necessarily um, go through, but I can work around. I can still tackle life head on, um, even though I can't defeat it completely. Yeah. And you mentioned that the obstacles and I'm curious, what was the most difficult part about writing the book for you? Oh, I think completing it. I think it flowed pretty well for a long time and uh, having to put myself out there doing podcasts, uh, posting on social media, I've pretty much been hiding out for the past yeah. five years as I'm working through treatments and therapies, um, dealing with uh, my life now and after football and trying to be a, uh, individual in society that is productive. Um, so actually finishing it, um, and trying to work through the steps after, um, to do what I want to do is, is probably the most challenging part right now. I think it's, it's kind of what you mentioned. It's right now, everybody watches the NFL and they see the guys that play, but then you don't hear too much about things after they play and all the things that come from playing football and just talking with you right now, it's just, you, you kind of see like, there's a lot that comes from playing such a violent game. And, um, you know, it's, I can't even imagine what it's like dealing with some of the, the after effects from playing football. But it, um, that's why I think the book that you put out there um, can really help us as a reader kind of understand just the background of everything else that we don't know about that goes on with football. And that's how I feel, David, is I feel like I'm just a, I was a normal kid, a normal guy, part of the 99% of the individuals who got to, experience what it was like for those one percent to get to play professional football so my perspective i think is a unique one i was awkward at times it was uh, out of place at times um, and there's a lot of stories in there that are kind of fun that are seen from somebody like me as opposed to a ray lewis or a troy aikman uh you know who were destined to play in the nfl it was definitely not my trajectory growing up it was never really a thought um, so in the book, I, I share a lot of those stories, um, embarrassing stories, and also allow the reader 
uh, time, I call them timeouts and chalk talks where they can stop and reflect on some of uh, the things I went through and they can check in on their lives and, you know, put some things on paper. And um, so hopefully they can learn from what I went through and take something from what I went through and apply it to their lives as well. I love that. And, you know, you kind of touched on the fact just kind of growing up and everything. And I am curious to hear a little bit about your growing up life here. You attended, correct me if I'm wrong, it's called the Snower, Snowermish High School. Is that how you say it? <laughs> That's so close. Uh, Snowhomish. Snowhomish. Okay. Yeah. Uh, definitely English is my second language. Um, <laughs> but you played wide receiver, quarterback, running back, and defensive back. And then you also lettered in track and basketball, and you were also a top-ranked gymnast. So top-ranked youth gymnast, which is just, it's like you're doing a little bit of everything. It's its absolutely incredible that you're able to do all of that. Um, and you did this uh, with a problem in your foot that led specialists to believe that you had a permanent limp, which I think is just very interesting. How do you feel you were able to overcome this at such an early age to be such a good athlete as you are? Yeah, like you said, I was born with... I call them crippled feet. Uh, basically, it was in cast, learned how to walk while I was in cast, um, had these little iron bars that I just learned while writing the book, uh, you know, that kind of kept my feet and legs separated. Um, also had asthma, also suffered from migraines um, as a kid. So I guess I didn't know what it was like to feel good or for things to be easy. So I think it led to me developing a a work ethic that helped me out later on down the road. And um, I think a lot of those sports, I was able to take a lot of things away from each of them, from coaches, from uh, the athletes that I, I played with. And truth, <laughs> truth be told is I just wasn't great at any one, but I just loved playing. I loved uh, the competition and, uh, you know, wasn't a great high school football player, which is why I had to go, pole vault at a community college and then later walk on to a relatively small school. And uh, that work ethic carried over through that career. Finally got to play my senior year of, uh, in college and things worked out and uh, got a chance to, to play in the NFL. So a very unique, unlikely story and uh, just felt very fortunate to have that chance and made the most of it. You really did. And, and you kind of touched on it that you got on as a pole vaulter at Clackamas Community College, and then you walked on in Eastern Washington. And first two years, you were mixed, not a lot of opportunity there, but you really, towards the end of your time, there really turned it on, set the stage as your senior year. You started 14 games as a wide receiver for the 97 football team that had 12 and 2 record. You won the Big Sky Conference title, advanced to the Division 1AA playoffs. You led the team with 57 catches for 1,148 yards, which was a school record, and 13 receiving touchdowns, which also tied a school record, while you practiced the gymnastics. But I'm curious, was this at the point where you thought, hey, I actually might be able to play at the next level, or had that not crossed your mind at this point? It literally never crossed my mind. Uh, heading into my senior year, I thought I'd be sharing reps with another receiver and, uh, and started off that season and did pretty well, caught three touchdowns in each of the first two games. And I think that solidified my starting position. And uh, as the season went on, uh, our team was was doing great. Uh, we went into Montana, University of Montana, which would dominated the one double A back then and uh, came out with the win. And I had a, a good game. And I remember one of our athletic trainers, uh, she said, hey, I don't remember which team, but a team is coming in to watch your video. And I was like, what? I had no idea even the process of it all. I didn't know how anything went, but I think that was the first time it crossed my mind that, wow, uh, I may have a chance at uh, playing at the next level. But up until that point, the only person who thought I would play or could play at that next level was my dad. I'm like, dad, I'm not even getting on the field in my college. And he was like, oh, you can play with these guys. You're as big as these guys. And I'm like, gosh, he was nuts. But uh, yeah, it was a, a crazy time for sure. Yeah, and then it, it probably, obviously you didn't get drafted, but you were able to sign as an undrafted free agent with the Dallas Cowboys after the 98 draft. You were regularly the team's fifth wide receiver. You played mostly on special teams and you were a very good special teams player. Um, do you feel that they gave you the, a chance to succeed there? Did they give you enough opportunities when you were in Dallas? I think they did. I think uh, another interesting point is 
and it kind of solidifies my point earlier is I wasn't on any special teams at Eastern Washington. Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to return the kicks or punts because I don't think I was seen as a guy who could do that, who was able to do that and wasn't relied or counted on to do those types of things. So I never returned a kick or punt in college. Uh, but I knew at the next level, they have that saying, the more you can do. And so I had to learn, you know, to catch punts, to catch kicks, to run down and tackle on punt coverage and kickoff coverage. And uh, they did in Dallas with Chan Gailey, who was a new coach and mm -hmm. had a, you know, spread offense with four or five receivers on the field at, at one, one time. So I felt that was a good opportunity. Um, but the, what I had to do going back to the work ethic is I studied each position. I wanted being a backup receiver. I needed to know, you know, Michael Irvin's position. I needed to know Billy Davis's position. I had had to line up in the backfield with Emmett Smith and protect Troy Aikman. I had to run routes out of the backfield. So really that mentality of the more you can do um, was very helpful, but they definitely gave me an opportunity, but I did feel way in over my head as I just had that one year of playing experience in college and you didn't have to read blitzes and mm -hmm. defenses and, you know, adjust your routes. And then in the NFL, it was, it was crazy. So it was a ton of study and uh, mentally it was the most challenging. And then in 2000, when you were, allocated to the Berlin Thunder of NFL Europe. That's where it seems like you kind of got your footing a little bit there. You did really well over there, had seven touchdowns, helped the them to a league best record, seven and three, and you won the World Bowl 2000. Did that give you confidence once you went back to the league after that? It did. It was a great opportunity. I loved it over there. It was actually the Ryan Fire, uh, who I love and still am in contact with. And um it did. It gave me the opportunity to have more playing experience, you know, as a wide receiver. Uh, you don't get a ton of time with Dallas. Um, you know, I didn't have to play special teams over there, just really focus on uh, the wide receiver position. Um, unfortunately, I did get hurt while I was over there. I tore up my foot and toe and ankle. Um, and so I came back to Dallas, uh, you know, injured and uh, went through that training camp, just uh, rehabbing and a position open for me in Miami. And they traded me over there and had a great experience, great time with Dallas, loved it. Um, and then needed to try to make the most of my time in Miami after that. Yeah. I mean, Miami, you really, once you said like, once you got traded to Miami, it seemed like you really, things kind of clicked a little bit more. You reunited with Chan Gailey, who is now the OC there. And during that season against the Packers, you returned a punt for an 81-yard touchdown, the third largest longest punt in the team history. You had a league-leading and franchise single-season record, 17-yard punt return average. And then back in 2001, your 11.8-yard punt return average ranked eighth in the NFL. What did you feel that Miami did differently for you when you got there that allowed you to feel like they were using your full talents uh, compared to Dallas? Yeah, I feel like uh, more responsibility fell on my shoulders. Um, progressively worked my way into, uh, you know, being the starting punt returner. And punt returning is not a desired position. It's uh, it's one that requires a little, uh, you got to be a little nuts <laughs> to, to want to do that, to be able to focus on catching a, a ball that's difficult to, uh, you know, as the ball spins. and and then having 11 guys and trying to see, do I call a fair catch? Do I run? You know, it's, uh, it's a tough position, but it, I saw it as one that if I could do it and if I could do it well, you know, it would keep me um, as a valuable piece on a team. So uh, progressively caught a couple balls that, you know, eventually led me to be the starting punt returner and then had that one big play against green Bay. And um, it was, you know, kind of a breakout moment. Um, it was one that gave me a lot of confidence and it was definitely a big boost. And um, I was just grateful for that opportunity. I was able to make the most of it. Yeah, you, you really did. And um, again, time in the league was definitely, uh, you, you put your mark when you were in the league. And um, it, it's very, uh, kind of when you're talking to me about the punt return stuff, we watch it on TV and it's very, I'm always wondering, I'm like, how, how can they just, figure out when they all these guys are running at them full speed still focus on catching the ball at hand. like even if you're fair catching it 
Mm -hmm. Um, it's, I think it's one of the most difficult things in football, and I think it's one of those things that fans, us as a fan doesn't realize just how difficult it is. But when you put it in perspective, it very much uh, you can kind of get that sense for sure. Yeah, it's uh, as opposed to a kickoff, you kind of know where that ball is going to fall. When somebody punts it and it's a spiral, as it's coming down, it'll take off to the right or left, depending on what foot kicker um there is but then it also goes away from the body so you got to kind of line up to the right and expect it to fall short it's just a a weird um catch um process of it all and uh that green bay kick uh the punter the ball was snapped high and he had he had to rush the punt he kicked it low i thought i was just gonna be calling a fair catch but didn't have time to call the fair catch and like i have either get away from the ball or catch it and get your head knocked off and of course, I made <laughs> a bad decision, but it turned out well. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to catch it, and I'm going to take a huge hit. And uh, fortunately, everybody just kind of ran past me, and I had nothing to do except not trip on my way to the end zone. But uh, it is a, a scary uh, position to play at times, but if you do it well, you can stay on a team for a long time. Yes, very true. I mean, special teams are such an important part of the game, and if you excel at them uh, – they change everything for a team. So I, I definitely agree with that. I am curious to talk about a little bit of some things post-career. Uh-huh. After you finished your career in 2002 with the Ravens, now you appeared in season seven and eight of the Bravo show, The Millionaire Matchmaker, where you sought a date. I'm curious. I just want to know, what, what's it like being on one of those shows? Because you see the stuff on TV. What's it? What was the experience like for you? Uh, looking back on it, I still cringe. I got starting to sweat. I don't know how I was able to do that looking back. Um, I was uh, working uh, with a fitness company and uh, was approached for that show. And I was like, that's a great way to promote myself, promote the company, you know, and, uh, and it was just awkward to be honest, you know, I'm standing (laughs) in a room and they're like, all right, you know, go out there and, and pick from these women, you know, talk to them and, you know, you're having a beer and it's, you know, 11 AM and, um, you know, trying to come up with questions and it's like, yeah, like going to a bar and that's not comfortable anyway. And just interviewing all these ladies, but, um, uh, it was fun. They did a, a great job with it. And just to see how that world works. Um, yeah, a lot of crazy, I don't even know if I'm even allowed to talk about it, but uh, <laughs> there's this one interesting, they didn't, they cut it, but you know, they kind of demonstrate and they try to show, you know, why I would need to pick them. And there's this one female who she, I hope I don't get sued. She brought her, um, (laughs) she brought her talent. So they had me sit down on this couch and they're like, all right, I don't know her name, Samantha, you know, she wants to show you something. So she pulled out, she had a portable pole. So she put this pole up. It was portable. You can carry it with her. She was a pole dancer. (laughs) Awesome. Very talented, skilled. You got to be an athlete to do that. So she goes and performs this pole dancing 11 a.m. in front of, you know, 20 other women. And I'm just sitting there on this couch they brought in and not knowing what to do. And, of course, her top just falls off while she's upside down, nothing on underneath. And uh, I'm like, my gosh, what did I get myself into? So I've experienced just because of, you know, playing in the NFL, I've, I've got to experience a lot of things that I probably wouldn't normally get to experience. And that was just one of them. That's not in the book, by the way. <laughs> I want my mom to hear this. <laughs> I do have one last question about that. Do they make you play a persona or do they have you be your actual self? Because you see shows like this and you're like, I can't actually be that. Right? Is it a, do they tell you like, I want you to act this certain way type of thing? Or They have producers that kind of say, all right, here's the angle, you know, Jeff, we see you, I think on one, they, they said I was a cliff diver, you know, that I jump into things and, uh, you know, <laughs> out, you know, doing my due diligence. And um, so it's like, you know, it's, it's a real quick thing. It's, it's there's a storyline that they want to, um, you know, tell and somewhat, a, you know, you're a character and trying to play that part. And it's reality television. But is it? <laughs> it's. I don't want to get sued again. But, I understand. Yeah, it's 
I've always thought it'd be kind of interesting to do one of those shows. So actually, you're the first NFL guy I've interviewed that's done a reality show. So I was kind of excited just to kind of hear your thoughts on it. But well, I'll just I think I can say this, but uh, they came to do you know some footage of I was living in Austin at the time, and so the producers are coming over to film I don't know my house and do some other stuff and. Um, so they show up, they showed up about, I don't know, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes early. <laughs> and my girlfriend was <laughs> over at the time. So they walk in, my girlfriend and I are like having coffee, whatever. And they're like, all right, we're, we're here to shoot, you know, this, this part for uh, your TV show. And, and they're like, ah, not a big deal. You have a girlfriend, <laughs> but just <laughs> push her off to the side. <laughs> so it was, I guess that's not out of the ordinary for that. But um, my girlfriend, who's no longer my girlfriend for obvious reasons, um, you know, it was fine though. It was fun. I've had a lot of fun for sure. Oh my God, that's that's hilarious. I love that. Yeah. Uh, the thing I wanted to ask you is that I read you own a fitness club. Do you, do you still own one? No, I did. I got into fitness after retiring and thought I'd, you know, wanted to coach. And I ended up coaching like four seasons at all, every level. And just got burnt out with that after a couple of years and got into the whole fitness side of it and uh, love that, love the nutrition, working out and, you know, the wellness aspect of it. And I uh, did open a gym and wanted to, I thought that's the, what I wanted to do. And it was great while it lasted, but no, I uh, did that, did the outdoor boot camp stuff, which was great. And then the, the issues that, you know, have arisen with my head and uh just no longer allowed me to work in that capacity and um so now i'm found purpose found direction again and i'm hoping to uh, provide therapies for individuals with brain trauma and not just counseling not just medicine but you know some therapies that allow individuals in my situation to not just exist, not just be alive, but to actually live life. I love that. And I know I'm looking forward to reading your book because it just really, it just, I think it sets the tone and, and really allows us to, to, again, I know I said it before to see the other side of football and, and get to know you guys better just from everything that stems from, from football. And um, it's, it's definitely something that I think that will be highlighted a lot more and more as years go along here. And I can't thank you enough for being willing to share your story with not you know just us today but everybody that's going to read your book i think it's going to be it's incredible okay thank you thank you and uh jeff I, I would be remiss if i didn't say i wanted to get you out of here with a little bit of what makes this show unique it's a little triple uh, triple play rapid fire so i'm gonna ask you just some rapid fire questions all right. bring and, it all right i like it let's start off with the first one cowboys dolphins or ravens jerseys <sighs> cowboys can't beat that star uh, all right i like it French fries or onion rings? French fries. McDonald's. Oh, <laughs> McDonald's? I don't know. I, I smell them. It's just that brings you back to your, probably your childhood. But there's just something about that smell that I don't know. I, I, can, res I can respect that. Um, stranded in Antarctica or stranded in the desert? I would say Antarctica. I'd just go ice fishing. At least I'd have some food. <laughs> okay i i like it especially i feel like being the the heat with the desert not seeing anybody used to have mirages and all that oh yeah yeah, yeah I'd hallucinate uh, for sure be reborn in the past or in the future past all this technology confuses me stresses me out uh but it's actually super cool that we could actually do this uh but i think uh, i like the values uh of the past i think maybe the 60s is where I'd want to live. The 60s. Okay. Yeah. You already know the exact decade. I do. I do. Is there anything specific about the 60s? Ah, this sounds so weird. I, I just picture going to sock hops. <laughs> 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 Poodle skirts. I just picture, you know, girls dancing like this and, you know, actually going to concerts and listening to, to records and go getting the malt. Um, uh, you know, after a Friday night football game, I guess I just pictured Greece. <laughs> it's what I grew up with. So when I put this out, I'll have to put like hashtag sock hop or something. Like yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> the word to, to suck maybe edit that part out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
All right, give you two more. You okay. can go back to one day in your life and repeat it or change it. Do you know the exact day you would do? <sighs> Gosh, you're asking a guy with a brain injury. To, oh, to I'm think sorry. Back. Like yesterday? Um, I honestly, I remember draft day in mm. – in 98 and had all my family around in the kitchen and of course we didn't have cell phones so just getting that call from the dallas cowboys and having the coach come on and say you know welcome to the 1998 dallas cowboys uh even though i didn't think i'd make the team but you know just getting off the phone and hugging my family and uh it was just a super cool moment that not only i got to feel but i think my family did as well and for everybody to be able to share in that moment no matter what happened after that i was i was pretty special so i'd repeat that i think that's a great choice uh the last one i'm gonna give you this one's a little harder okay sandpaper as toilet paper or hot sauce as eye drops <laughs> oh man sandpaper is toilet paper i think i'll just hold it i think, <laughs> you think um, hot sauce gosh i'm gonna have to go i would do sandpaper as toilet paper and i just would stop eating so i'd never have to go I'd just go to the bathroom once a week or something that's crazy dave that's awful questions but <laughs> they're, they're, i'm sure you've never been asked them before right they're just no, uh... never would you rather that's that's that game um that was the hardest question you were right <laughs> <laughs> never well, coming Jeff, back to the show <laughs> I'm, if you come back i'll have I'll some more good ones for you too Ed. I love it. i'm gonna be ready i'll be prepared i'll have some <laughs> <for you. laughs> i love it jeff on that note thank you so much for joining the show today I, I truly appreciate your time and and you being willing to share your story with the audience here well, great thanks for having me and uh anytime you need me back i'll be ready awesome well it definitely will be because i'm gonna have some more of these for you um great. but Please, uh, before we get out of here, please, again, plug your great book that you have out there and um, everything that you want the audience to just kind of leave on as we conclude interview today. Yeah, the book is called Tackle Life Head On. Um, it's a playbook for on defeating life's obstacles. It's not just football. It's a lot of other stories of how I was able to um, achieve that dream, overcome the obstacles that led me to uh, playing the NFL and kind of what my life is like. Um, now and the obstacles I'm dealing with currently. Uh, the book can be found on liveheadon.com. Uh, you go there, shipping's included, tax included, $20 gets you the book and a personalized and autographed uh, copy. Uh, go check it out. The proceeds um, go to help with therapies of other individuals uh, suffering from traumatic brain injuries. And it's a great cause and I'm happy to be a part of it. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jeff. You're a great man. And it was an honor to be able to talk with you today. And I'm looking forward to the next time. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody that's listening. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll catch you guys in the next one.